Okay, I'm doing an overheating test. Now let me check the modulation on this mic. Get it around so I can see it. Testing, testing. Okay, that all looks pretty good. Okay, so I'm going to do an overheating test. And before I forget, let me set my alarm on my watch here. Set. And I've got it set for 40 minutes. Let me, let me back it down to 30. 30 minutes. Okay. Start. Okay. So I got my countdown timer set for 30 minutes. I don't know if I can sit here and talk for 30 minutes. And I don't know if you want to watch me sit here and talk for 30 minutes. But I'm going to, um, I guess I'll use this as an opportunity to rant a little bit. But uh, the main thing is I want to see if this iPhone 6S Plus will shoot a half an hour of 4K video without overheating. I can't imagine me shooting a clip longer than a half an hour, but a half an hour will give us a good test because a lot of cameras that you buy that shoot stills and videos and all are also limited to a half an hour. Of course, you buy a video camera, you can go for two hours, whatever. I don't know what you're going to do with two hours of 4K video, but I digress. So, so here we go. We're going to do this for 30 minutes, whatever this is. Actually, a little longer than 30 minutes because it was running for maybe a minute or so before I hit the timer and actually started the recording. So it's going to be 31 minutes that it'll run. The finished video should be 30 minutes. So let me start off with something about photography. I was listening to a photography podcast just a little while ago. And um, all these... Um, what I call technically correct. We've got political correct and we've got technically correct. All these technically correct people. And by the way, this is an iRig HD, iRig mic HD. And I've got a separate video review on this. I really like this mic. And this fuzzy thing I put on here, it was $12 on Amazon. And it should get rid of the pops when I have peas, Peter, Piper, popped a popper but anyway and also when there's wind it should deal with that so I think I might leave the fuzzy thing on there all the time it's gonna be interesting if I shoot 30 minutes of this video I'm not monitoring my audio and the audio is all terrible because this muffy things on here that'll be interesting so getting back to what I was talking about technologically correct all these log rollers out in Silicon Valley and all these people that do podcasts and so on and so forth, they love to go out of their way and say that the gear doesn't matter, that camera equipment doesn't matter, that it's the photographer that makes the photo. And I just was listening to a podcast, I won't name which one, and they said basically the three things that matter are shutter speed, ISO, and aperture when you're taking photos that the rest is all fluff. All the fancy other features that cameras have, is that's all fluff. Well, they just confirmed that the gear matters. Because those three things they just mentioned, you have to have a decent camera for it to be able to shoot, for example, at high ISOs. Let's say you're shooting in very low light, and let's say the lens you have is not a very fast lens. Let's say the best it can do is f4, and let's say you've got a moving object, so you need a shutter speed that's up there a little bit. Let's say you need 1 250th of a second to get any kind of reasonable stop motion. And let's say you're panning with the moving item, and you know that's reasonable. You'll probably be able to do a good job at 1 250th. At 1 50th, it's all going to be blurred, right? So if you want a higher shutter speed, then you're going to have to do one of two things. You're either going to have to have a very fast lens, like a f4 lens or something, so that you can let more light in, so that you can shoot at a higher shutter speed and open that aperture up to f1.4. Or you're going to have to have a camera that will shoot at higher ISOs. So they're contradicting themselves. When they're saying that those are the three things that matter, and then they're saying that the gear really doesn't matter, uh, I don't understand. Because if you want 
a high shutter speed and the and it's low light you're going to have to have either a camera that will shoot at high ISO which is expensive by the way I just ordered the A7S Mark II which is probably the best high ISO camera ever made and I did that for a reason because I do like to shoot in low light and or natural light or room light this right now is what I would call medium room light. I've got some light coming in from the two windows there, but it's kind of cloudy out, so it's not very much light here. But it's nice soft light coming in. And I like to be able to shoot in that kind of a situation. And if I need to bump my shutter speed up because I've got a moving object, I like to have the versatility in my gear so that I can do that. And if I'm shooting an event and I know that I'm going to be in, in mixed lighting situations. I used to shoot with Nikon and I, I used a 24 to 70 zoom lens and a 70 to 200 zoom lens. Those are two of their pro go-to lenses for events, especially for like weddings, things like that. Both of those lenses are expensive and they're heavy. And they're expensive and they're heavy because A, they have a nice big aperture f2.8 so that lets in a good amount of light for a zoom lens and b they're sharp so if i take a portrait at 135 millimeters on that lens it's going to be nice and sharp if i take a portrait at 70 millimeter with the 24 to 70 it's going to be pretty sharp so don't understand these people that say that the gear doesn't matter. Of course, usually these are the people who have the right gear for the job. And like right now, this is a perfect example. I'm shooting this 4K video with an iPhone 6S Plus, which, suit, which shoots 4K video. So for a starting point, it shoots 4K, so that's a big deal. And I'll get into that too. That's my next rant. And then I've got this uh, iRig Mic HD digital mic. And by the way, what this does is this converts what I'm saying digitally from analog into a digital signal and then sends it down this cable into the lightning port. So there's not a very good chance that I'm going to pick up any interference in this cable because it's already been converted to digital and it's doing its thing and it's going right into the phone. So that's really cool. So, um, I wish I had an indicator light on the front of the phone to tell me that it was still recording. I have no idea. I could be talking to the phone and it's not even recording. That's the downside to not having an articulating screen so that you can see what is happening. Because I'm using the front-facing camera, so I can't see what's on the back there. Maybe I should set up a mirror, right? Put that on the list, buy a mirror. So, anyway... Getting on to 4K video and why that's important. I see all these people saying, and by the way, a lot of the iPhone reviewers just skirted right by the 4K video as if it's not a big deal, it's not important, and so on. And they, in my opinion, they don't know what they're talking about because, and also, by the way, people that do reviews on 4K. I was just watching a review on the A7R Mark II. I think that's what they call it. The new 42 megapixel one that also shoots internal 4K, which I was going to order, but I decided not to because it shoots in Super 35 mode. And we'll get into the size of the sensor. That I want to rant about that too. But first 4K, then the size of the sensors. Okay, so 4K. So this guy's doing the review. He's basically saying he likes shooting in 4K so that he can crop in and do like pan and zoom effects and things like that. And by the way, I have a video on my channel showing how to do that. And then export the final video in 1080p because, quote, nobody can watch 4K. Okay. First of all, there are people that can watch 4K. Second of all, if you go into a Costco right now, you'll notice that the 4K TVs have come down in price to where they're almost the same as a 1080p TV. So, right around the corner here, a lot of people are going to have 4K TVs. And if you're shooting content and then producing your fi finished work, putting a lot of work into it and all that, and exporting it in 1080p, 
then and putting it up on YouTube and then you're getting views on YouTube and so forth and people might be bookmarking it. You might be adding it to a playlist and so on. You can't later go back and switch that video out. I wish YouTube let us do that. There, I have some videos that I'd like to switch out, right? And keep the same URL and, and all that. But they won't let you do that. You got to upload a whole new video. So now you're starting over. So, so then what do you do? You keep the 1080p version of the video and you have a 4K version of the same video up there twice. Now people are getting confused. It's just ridiculous. What you should be doing is shooting everything in 4K now and your finished product should also be in 4K. And you should upload it to YouTube in 4K and then you're done. It's there. And if somebody has a 4K TV, they can watch it in 4K. If they don't, they can watch it in 1080p. YouTube provides a stream and, and whatever they want to watch it at, whatever quality level they want to watch it at. Now, this isn't rocket science. I don't understand these so-called experts giving ridiculous advice. I have people commenting on my videos about 4K saying, oh, I don't need 4K. I'm shooting everything in 1080p. What does anybody need 4K for? Nobody can watch 4K. I mean, talk about an ignorant statement. What's going to happen three or four years from now when all of their content is 1080p and everybody wants 4K? What are they going to do? Are they going to go back and reproduce all that content? Let's say, heaven forbid, they didn't keep all the original footage that they may have shot in 4K. Or let's say, heaven forbid, they're shooting everything in 1080p. They're not even shooting in 4K. Then, the, then they're done. They're toast. They can't, there's nothing they can do. If I, if I shoot an event, I did the Middletown Heritage Festival yesterday, and I shot, of course, in 4K. If I did an event in 1080p like that, produced a nice video in 1080p, put it up on my YouTube channel, Four years from now, that YouTube, it's, it's obsolete. People aren't going to care about that video. People are going to want to see. It's like right now. Do I really want to see something in standard definition? Am I really going to search out and go around YouTube and, and, and look for a video that's in standard definition? No. I'm going to look for something that's at least in high definition, at least in 1080p, if not 4K. I'm not, I, I don't want the old stuff. I don't want the stuff. Remember the old DVDs? What were they? 540p? What is it? What's it? 480p? Whatever they were. I get confused. But they were not even high def. They weren't even 720p. And, and when I come across one of those and I'm watching it on YouTube or something, I mean, the quality's terrible. They didn't have a choice probably back when they made that. Or maybe they did. If they did, they made the wrong choice. Always do the higher resolution. So I'm going to switch hands here. I wonder if there's handling noise on this mic. Can you hear that? So, and I had a family member that um, had a whole bunch of photos, old photos. And they sized them down to 800 pixels across. Because this was back in the day when computer monitors were 800 pixels. And it's like, hey, that's going to fill the whole monitor. Why do I ever need a photo that's more than 800 pixels across. So what they did was they resized all their photos to save disk space. They didn't keep the originals. They, they sized them all down to 800 pixels across. And I think they started out around 2,000 pixels across out of the camera. So they sized them down significantly. And now all of those photos are tiny when you look at them on a regular monitor on today's monitors, they don't even feel like probably maybe even half the monitor. And so they can't go back and fix that. Same thing with video. A 1080p video is about two megapixels for each frame. And the 4K, and I'm rounding these numbers off, is eight megapixels. So it's four times as much information. It's not even close. 
And even when I shoot 4K with something like the iPhone, I'm getting a lot more detail than I'm getting with a much better camera that happens to be 1080p. And so there's every reason, every reason to shoot in, in 4K. We never should have been shooting in 1080p or even less than that, 720p and then the, the old days, right? The only reason we were is the computers, the processors couldn't handle it, couldn't handle that much data, couldn't process it. This phone, is, it's unbelievable. This is a full-blown computer. Oh, and that's another rant. Before I get to, to um, let me see how much time I have left here. Okay, I have 14 minutes left. I've gone half. Okay. This is easier than I thought, filling up time. I don't know. It may be overheating already. It may have a warning on the other side of the screen that I don't even know. It might not even be recording anything right now. I have no idea. And I'm not going to get up on two lays. I'm not going to get up and walk around and look behind there. But um, sensor size, what else was I going to talk about? 4K, 1080p. Uh-oh, there was something I was going to talk about before I got the sensor size. Darn it. Just slipped my mind. Well, maybe it'll come back. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's get into sensor size. This is another thing that that has spurred some controversy on my channel. I came out with a video saying that micro four thirds cameras are not for me. And specifically the GH4, which Anything over 1600 ISO falls apart, you're done for. And with micro four thirds, it's a challenge to get a shallow depth of field. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're doing a stand up, you're at an event. And let's say you want to have the tripod like I have right here. The tripod's less than three feet. The camera is less than three feet, maybe two and a half feet or so from my face. And I got a mic and I got a quick cable. And let's say I was doing a side by side where I was standing next to somebody and I was interviewing them. I want that tripod to be relatively close because I don't want it. If it's 10 feet away and you're at an event, people are going to be walking between you and the tripod and tripping over the cable and all kinds of things can go wrong. Right. You want to eliminate as many potential hazards as possible. So having the the tripod 10 feet away at a, at a crowded event to do a stand up is not a good option. So you've got the tripod relatively close. So you need a relatively wide angle lens. You probably need on a full frame, you probably need about a 35 millimeter equivalent to pull that off. Now, if you got a 35 millimeter lens or field of view, 35 millimeter, and you put that puppy at about F2, and you're both about the same distance from the camera with modern face detection and all, you probably will be able to get by with, with autofocus and it'll keep a nice focus on your face and you're gonna have a nice blurred background, a nice soft background. So if there's a lot of things going on back there, junk or whatever, you, you're gonna have focus on the subject, right? You want that, you wanna be able to do that at an event. And and sometimes you don't care. Sometimes everything can be in focus. Like right now, everything's in focus because this has a tiny sensor. But here's the thing. There might be times when you want to blur the background. With a full frame sensor, you can do that relatively easily. I could take that lens and take it all the way down to f1.4, depending on the lens I have, and really blur that background. Even at 35 millimeter, I can, I can do that. Now, go to a GH, let's say you have a Panasonic GH4. And again, you have a 35 millimeter field of view, so it'll be half that, whatever half of 35 millimeter is, 17, whatever, whatever it is. So, you, but you have a 35 millimeter field of view. And let's say you take that same lens and you put it at F2, right? On the micro four thirds. The background isn't gonna be near as blurred. You're gonna have more depth of field. You're gonna have more things in focus. And by the way, that's another pet feed. People say, um, I want, I want a lot of depth of field. And when they say that, they think they're saying that they want the background blurred. No, that's the opposite. If you have a lot of depth of field, then a lot of things are in focus. If you have a shallow depth of field 
or very little depth of field, that's when the foreground and or the background can be out of focus. So you can have a, a, a sliver that's in focus and then everything before it and everything back behind it is out of focus. That's called a shallow depth of field. So anyway, the Micro Four Thirds, so they've come out with all these speed boosters and they've come out with like F.95 lenses and all these ways to try to get a shallow depth of field. And so people respond to me on my channel, oh, you can do it, you gotta do this. That, blah, blah. I'm sorry, I don't wanna jump through all those hoops. Why am I gonna go through all that trouble if I want a shallow depth of field? There's great full frame sensors out there that I can use that I can get that very easily without jumping through a whole bunch of hoops, okay? And so I would go that route. And so here's the thing, if I want reach, then I'm gonna go with a one inch sensor which I've done reviews on my Panasonic FC1000 and my Sony RX100 Mark IV that has a one inch sensor. And these have nice reach. The, um, actually the Sony does not, but that's another issue. That's a super compact camera. The overheating, let's get into that too. Ah, if I remember. So much to rant about. So the one inch sensor on the Panasonic FC1000 in 4K mode, it goes from about 37 millimeter to almost 600 millimeter. That's a lot of reach. And that's an all-in-one camera. And the footage is, I think, very acceptable for event coverage and so on and so forth. It's sharp enough for my work. And so I get a ton of reach. And it'd be very difficult for me to get that same amount of reach with a micro four thirds, even though you can get a lot of reach with those as well it's going to be difficult with one relatively compact lens to go all the way from 37 millimeter to almost 600 millimeter. So if I want reach, I'm going to go with the one inch sensor. And again, it's going to be difficult for me to get a shallow depth of field if the camera is close to the subject and I'm shooting at the widest, which is 37 millimeter. It's going to be kind of difficult at f2.8 is the fastest that lens gets. It's going to be kind of difficult to get a shallow depth of field but if I zoom in on somebody at like, let's say 200 millimeter and I'm shooting at F4 at 200 millimeter, that's the fastest you can shoot is F4. The, the background is gonna be blurred even with a one inch sensor. So in certain circumstances, you can get a blurry background with that camera. But again, if I'm using that camera, I'm using it for reach. I'm using it for other reasons, not to get the blurry background. So I guess what I'm saying is you've got the full frame way over here that can get you that shallow depth of field. You've got the one inch sensor that can get you the reach and the versatility and it's lightweight and, and all that. And then you've got micro four thirds in the middle in no man's land. It doesn't do either thing well. It doesn't do the reach thing well. It doesn't do the, the blurred background well. It's kind of a nothing in the middle thing there. I have no interest in it, none whatsoever. You step up a little bit in size to APS-C, which is a slightly larger sensor than a micro four thirds. And now you can start getting that shallow depth of field. And if you want something that's really versatile that can get you that shallow depth of field under the right circumstances and can get you some pretty good reach. If I was gonna go that route with a compromise camera like that, I'd go APS-C, I'd skip the micro four thirds altogether because it doesn't do either one well. So, um, sensor size. So getting back to sen sensors, of course, in the cell phone, very small, very small sensor. So just about everything's gonna be in focus most of the time. That's just the way it is. And you just have to frame your shots and just live with the fact that everything's gonna be in focus. Oh, what else was I gonna talk about? Darn it. Was something to do with Leo. Oh, the phones. Ah, yes, I do remember now. We were talking about the phone and how amazing it is, how powerful it is. And Leo the other day was talking about Leo Laporte, twit.tv. I'm a fan, even though I don't agree with a lot of the things he says. Um, he was talking about how expensive the iPhone is, specifically this one, the 6S Plus with 128 gigabytes how expensive it is. It's a thousand bucks. Okay, first of all, it's really not that much more expensive than a high-end Android phone, I 
think they're about the same price or close enough. You get the same amount of storage, you know, apples to apples. Uh, it wouldn't be apples to apples, but anyway, apples to Androids. They're about the same price. So let, setting that aside, he complains about how expensive these things are. And he made the comment, I can buy a Windows laptop, a real good one, for like 600 bucks. Okay. The Windows laptop, first of all, is probably junk. Second of all, it doesn't have two good cameras built into it. It might have one. It doesn't have GPS built into it. It doesn't have, oh, cellular. A cellular, you can't make phone calls. Make and receive phone calls. Okay? There are a lot of things going on in this thing that we call a cell phone that aren't going on in that laptop. Plus, they had to shrink all this down and make it this size. That's not easy to do. This is a powerful computer in this thing. That's not easy to do. And the quality control is off the charts. The fit and finish and, and every the way Apple does all that. And yes, they have a big margin. Yes, they make good profits. But that's what allows them to do what they do and, and let me rant on this for a second, the fact that they do make good money allows them to have all the money in the world so that when they negotiate with their suppliers, they can go to a supplier and they can say, I want $50 million of this part and I'll prepay you for it. And they can get amazing deals on their supply chain. And so they have a lot of leverage. And the fact that they come out with a phone once a year, basically, allows them to have economies of scale where they make the same phone for the whole year. And so they talk about mass production, my goodness. Whereas Android's coming out with a new phone every two weeks, the different Android manufacturers and so on, it's all, talk about fragmentation, talk about a nightmare. And that's why they can't maintain any quality control. That's why they don't have the buying power that Apple has. That's why the phones are generally junk and the operating system is a nightmare. Other than that, it's a great choice. And here's the thing. Leo, for a long time, has been telling people to get the Android phone and has been bragging that he uses the Android phone. And I really feel sorry for his listeners and all that, 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 that you know, trust him for advice and go out and follow his advice. And then he goes out and buys the other phone a month later, buys another phone. He can buy phones every two weeks, right? He's got money. And he does reviews, and it's all part of his work. So, whereas John Q. Public, who listens to his advice of the week, his, avi his advice, what do you call it? The Daily Special? Well, anyway, forget about it. Um, du jour, whatever, yeah, soup du jour, soup of the day. Well, well, anyway, his phone of the day, and they go out and they buy that phone. They got to live with that phone for a year or two, right? They're stuck with that phone. Hey save yourself the aggravation, buy an iPhone, buy a high-end iPhone and be done with it. Don't go down the Android road. It is a nightmare. No expert, no expert should recommend that you buy anything but an iPhone. And as far as computers, that you buy anything but a Mac computer. And tablets, buy an iPad. Don't buy Windows junk. Don't buy Android junk. Don't put yourself through that torture. Ah, boy, I am ranting. Okay, let me see what, what the timing is on this here. One minute, 33 seconds. Okay. So, uh, by the way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, when the alarm goes off on this watch, oh, by the way, I love the Apple Watch. Oh, ah, I get a minute, 20 seconds to rant. Leo also says there's no reason, there's no valid reason to have a, no use case or whatever for an Apple Watch. He bought one, wore it a couple days, but it doesn't wear it anymore. Now he says he's going to get an iPhone and he's going to start using it again and see, see, blah, 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 blah. Here's the thing. If you're sitting at your computer all day, like he does, and you've got the time right there and you've got everything right there on your computer and you've got your cell phone sitting there on the, on the table right in front of you, then yes, you can do everything you need to do with those two devices, with the cell phone and the computer sitting right there. But if you're an active person and you're out and about, like when I'm covering events or whatever, 
the last thing I want to be doing is fumbling for my phone if I get a quick text message or whatever. It's very convenient for me to just turn my wrist like this and see the text message and see the time. These people all say, oh, I don't need to see the time. It's on my, wa on my phone. I don't need a watch. I'm going to dig my phone out of my pocket every time I need to know the time. And guess what? A lot of things I do are time sensitive. When I'm covering events, a lot of times people will say, well, come on back at one and, and, and you can shoot this or that. And, or, you know, or meet me at such and such a place at noon or whatever. And so throughout the day, I'm often checking the time. Oh, by the way, there's the alarm. You hear it? Okay, so I'm going to dismiss that. And that's another thing that I use it for all the time is that alarm function. You, you just um, I don't know if you can see this getting away from the mic, by the way, but you, you uh, put that and you can set the time that you want it to count down and you, you just turn the, the, the crown and it changes the time. And then you can just hit start. And like if you're cooking eggs or whatever you're doing, sorry about moving the mic away from my mouth like that, but whatever you're cooking, it, it'll count it down. And just now I had it count down for this video. By the way, I got to wrap this up. But I mean, that this thing is so useful for text messages, for that timer that I just said, for setting alarm, for having alarms, for Siri, for asking Siri to do something, for asking Siri to set a reminder. I use Siri all the time. This next to the cell phone is probably the best tool I have during the day. They go hand in hand. I, actually, this might even trump the cell phone as far as usefulness. So for somebody like Leo to say that there's no real use case, it's, it, 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 you know, it, it's not there yet and the, the UI is terrible and all this. The UI is great depending on what you're using it for. If you're using it within its limitations and you're using it for some key things, I use it for text messages. I use it to answer phone calls from time to time. Oh, by the way, they also say phone calls. Nobody does phone calls anymore. Oh, no, I don't talk on the phone. So you're going to do a text message back and forth for 10 minutes to do what you could have done on the phone in 15 seconds. That's efficient. I don't talk on the phone. Anyway, all right, that's the end of my rant. I've gone more than 30 minutes. We're going to see if this thing's overheated or didn't overheat. In any event, subscribe to my channel. Um, craigship.com, by the way, is my URL. I, I'm going to sneak around the back here and see if this thing is still recording. I'm going to sneak around. Yes, it is still recording. Absolutely amazing. Apple knocks it out of the park. One more time. iPhone 6S Plus 4K video, more than 30 minutes long. Thumbs up, Apple. Thanks for watching. Hey, one more time. Hit the subscribe button. Thanks again. Okay, I used about 30% of the battery capacity to record this clip, and it was 12 gigabytes, and that's 33 minutes, 12 gigabytes, and the phone was not noticeably hot after I finished. So if you have enough battery life and enough storage, you could probably record for an hour or longer. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe.